Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to talk here about some of the uh, disorders relevant to the surgical questions that come up on the USMLE that pertain to the stomach. Now, fortunately, there are not a whole lot of things when it comes to surgery of the stomach that are covered on the USMLE. Now, if you go talk to your general surgeon attending, they'll tell you, yeah, I operate on the stomach all the time, but primarily they are going to be doing operations as it pertains to bariatric surgery. And you're not gonna be asked a whole lot about that because the USMLE does not ask about surgical procedures. They ask about surgical disorders, i.e. disorders that are going to require surgery or may require surgery. Now, if you go back to my GI section in internal medicine, you'll get a lot more about the stomach. Um, but those are not surgical disorders. Peptic ulcers, typically not surgical disorders, unless, of course, you have a rupture and peritonitis, but that's beyond the scope of this talk. So primarily here, we're going to be talking about adenocarcinoma uh, of the stomach, and that will be our primary focus, but I'll go into a couple other ancillary things that may come up on your exam, uh, but primarily here, I want you to focus on the adenocarcinoma when we get to it. If you haven't had the chance yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. You can get there by clicking the link in the description of the video or on the I button on the upper right hand corner. I very much appreciate all the contributions that I can get to help offset the cost of these videos. And I thank all those of you very much who have already donated. All right, so as I mentioned, the primary thing we're gonna be talking about here is gastric adenocarcinoma, but I'll briefly uh, bring up polyps and a couple other tumors, but I just want you to know that they're not very commonly tested, but the gastric adenocarcinoma most certainly is. All right, so gastric polyps share a lot in common with the colonic polyps as far as their histology. Um, so, We'll just start out by saying that primarily these occur in the elderly. Uh, they are not commonly tested because they are not commonly encountered. Think about it. Why do we see colon polyps? We see colon polyps because we do routine surveillance colonoscopies. If we didn't do routine surveillance colonoscopies, most of those polyps would never be found and they would never cause problems because colon polyps are, the vast majority of them are benign and will never be cancerous. And the same goes for gastric polyps. Gastric polyps, like I said, tend to happen in the elderly. They're usually discovered incidentally. And they also tend to happen more in patients who are on proton pump inhibitors. Now, why we don't really know uh, but I suspect that we may just see more polyps in people who are on proton pump inhibitors because those patients tend to have reflux disease or possibly ulcers. And we do EGDs or upper endoscopy on those patients more frequently than we would do on asymptomatic patients, unlike with colonoscopy where we do colonoscopy on asymptomatic patients all the time, as you know. Now, all gastric polyps that are more than one centimeter in diameter, if you do encounter them, should be snared out for biopsy. And there are a few different kinds of gastric polyps. The most common is hyperplastic, just like the hyperplastic polyps of the colon. Those tend to be um, benign. And there's also adenomatous polyps. They tend to be uh, have a higher risk of malignancy, just like the adenomatous polyps of the colon. Um, you should always remove these, um, but you don't really know if you're dealing with a hyperplastic polyp or an adenomatous polyp just by looking at it. So that's why we err on the side of if it's bigger than one centimeter, remove it. Now, if there is an adenomatous polyp, there's actually a 20% chance that the patient has an adenocarcinoma somewhere. Um, so that is something to keep in mind. Uh, fundic gland polyps are rare. Multiple polyps should always raise suspicion for fam familial polyposis syndrome. Uh, things like familial adenomatous polyposis, juvenile polyposis, uh, Putzi-Eger syndrome, Lynch syndrome, all these uh, things that you learn about in oncology. 
This is what a gastric polyp might look like. You can see very difficult to pick out um, just because they are uh, often the same color as the surrounding mucosa. They tend to be small. Uh, this is a, always a challenge when you're first learning how to do scopes is to really keep an eye out for these um, and, and, and to recognize them when you find them. So again, here's another one. This one's a little bit more obvious, but you can see it's the same color as the surrounding mucosa. And here you see multiple. This may be an, a, a patient who's either on long-term proton pump inhibitors or perhaps has a familial uh, polyposis syndrome. All right, let's get to the fun one, gastric adenocarcinoma. Fun to talk about, not fun to have. So this makes up about 85% of gastric cancers. If someone says, oh, so-and-so has stomach cancer, this is what they're talking about here. Now, there are a number of risk factors. This tends to happen in older men. Uh, people who are not white tend to have a higher risk for some reason. And the big risk factor here is H. pylori infection. H. pylori can take chemicals that are in our food that are otherwise harmless and turn them into carcinogenic compounds. The big one is the nitrates that are found in smoked and salty foods. And so for this reason, there are certain parts of the world where their diet predisposes them to gastric cancer. And I'm particularly talking about China and Japan. Now, I know not everybody there has the same diet, uh, but we do see higher incidences, especially in Japan. So if you look at a map of the incidence of, of gastric adenocarcinoma, you will see there's a relatively higher incidence in Japan for one reason or another. And it's probably because of their diet. Otherwise, the Japanese have a very, very good diet, by the way. High in fish, high in fiber, uh, but this one little thing uh, can cause problems. So the symptoms of gastric adenocarcinoma are your typical cancer symptoms, fatigue, anorexia, lymphadenopathy, um, and then anytime you see those cancer-like symptoms, you got to look at what other symptoms the patient has. So if they're getting frequent infections, think leukemia. If they're coughing up blood, think lung cancer. If they've got early satiety and belly pain, think gastric cancer. Another way that this could come up is they may tell you that they have supraclavicular lymphadenopathy. And you might think, well, that's up by your neck. It must be a, a squamous cell carcinoma of, of the head and neck or something like that. And as a matter of fact, the supraclavicular lymph nodes on the left are actually sentinel lymph nodes for abdominal cancers. And so these are called Verkau nodes, and you need to be aware of that because the USMLE loves to go after that. There's also something called the Sister Mary Joseph nodule. We'll get to that in a little bit. That one's kind of interesting. If you suspect ad gastric adenocarcinoma, you got a patient with early satiety and cancer-like symptoms, best initial test is an EGD. It's the only way you're going to be able to diagnose this because remember, cancer is always a histologic diagnosis. After you've made the diagnosis, you need to do your staging workup. That means getting a CT of the chest, abdomen, pelvis, getting an endoscopic ultrasound looking for lymph nodes, and then uh, you can do a laparoscopy. All of those will help us stage and plan our approach to treatment. This is what a gastric adenocarcinoma looks like. Uh, as you can see, it's a little bit bigger than a polyp. So, but you, you can't go just based on size alone. Okay. This is Sister Mary Joseph Dempsey. She was a nurse at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, which is not all that far from where I grew up. And what she found was this umbilical-like mass that occurs in patients with certain cancers. And what are those cancers? Gastric cancer, colon cancer, pancreatic cancer, and certain gynecologic cancers. Now, yes, they all occur in the abdomen and pelvis, but what do these have in common? They are all adenocarcinomas, okay? So that's interesting. So you can see these nodules here. This does come up on your exam. Now, gastric cancer can spread directly or hematogenously. Your typical suspects, liver, lung, and bone. They can also spread to the ovary. That's called a Krukenberg tumor. That's kind of an unusual place to metastasize. The treatment for gastric cancer is going to be subtotal or total gastrectomy, provided that this has not spread. Um, otherwise, the treatment is going to be palliative, which may include surgery, um, but uh, it just depends. But the only hope of cure is 
gastrectomy. Chemo radiation can also be done. You don't need to know the treatment modalities for gastric cancer, but you should know that a gastrectomy is the only hope for cure. Survival is generally quite poor by the time symptoms occur. This cancer is usually progressed. That's kind of the, uh, the problem for a lot of cancers uh, that have low, low survival is that what they share in common is they don't cause symptoms until it's too late. My mom is a big country music fan, and uh, there was a country music singer. Uh, his name was Toby Keith, and he was diagnosed with gastric cancer last year. My mom comes to me, and she's like, oh, is he going to be okay? And I had to deliver the bad news to him that his survival was probably about three to six months. And in fact, uh, a couple months ago, he did eventually succumb to that cancer. Now, there are a couple other lower yield cancers. The gastric malt lymphoma, uh, that comes from mucosal associated lymphoid tissue. This is a lymphoma, it makes up about 4% of gastric malignancies. There are other gastric lymphomas, the big one being diffuse large B cell cancer. Um, there is a difference between these two. So with, with malt, uh, that is typically due to an H. pylori infection is a big association. The symptoms and diagnosis is the exact same as, as adenocarcinoma, but the treatment is different. So with maltomas, H. pylori, if you treat that with triple therapy, so amoxicillin, clarithromycin, and omeprazole, in most instances, you will induce remission. So that's really nice, right? It's much better prognosis. Now, if you're dealing with a diffuse large B cell lymphoma rather than a multoma, the treatment is the same for other non-Hodgkin's lymphomas. And so that is RCHOP, rituximab, cyclophosphamide, hydroxydonurubicin or adramycin, oncovin or vincristine, and prednisone. So look up RCHOP because that's the treatment for NHL and that does get tested. You gotta know that one. This is a gastric lymphoma. Again, you can't tell what kind of cancer this is, if it's even cancer at all, just by looking at it. So you've got to get the biopsy. And don't worry about resecting the whole thing if it's big. Just get the biopsy and find out what it is and then deal with taking the rest of it out later. You're not going to be able to remove an entire tumor in most instances with an EGD. Okay, the last one, gastrointestinal stromal tumor. These are really rare, so I don't want to spend a whole lot of time talking about it. We don't really understand them. We don't really know the risk factors. All we know is that they tend to happen in older people, and von Recklinghausen's disease or neurofibromatosis 1 is a risk factor. Symptoms, GI bleeding, uh, epigastric pain, but a lot of times they're asymptomatic. You find them when you do an EGD. Incidentally, you go in, you take it out, and you find out it's a stromal tumor. So diagnosis is the same. Again, I just want to point out here, just remember that if you've ever got an older patient who's stable and has dysphagia, um, they're saying it's difficult for me to eat, it's uncomfortable for me to eat, I'm getting full really, really quickly, I can only eat a salad for dinner and I'm full, get an EGD. Treatment for a, a gastrointestinal stromal tumor is just complete resection with wide margins. These tend to be uh, pretty curable. Uh, if it's not resectable or they've got metastasis in rare instances, you would use imatinib. And yes, that is the same imatinib as we use for Philadelphia chromosome positive CML. And this is what it would look like on endoscopy. Again, you cannot tell the difference between this and other cancers.